turn my timer on here, so watch my time. Well, first of all, thanks for having me here this afternoon, and it's great to be on the banks of the Arkansas River. And I think with this particular topic, it's actually fitting that we're in a room that overlooks the river because um, the Arkansas River served as both a boundary and a guide in the 19th century, which encouraged expansion north and east from the Spanish and then the Mexican territory. And then it also encouraged the same um, expansion um, west from native lands and then the Louisiana Purchase. So I'm a specialist, like Daniel said, in colonial Latin America. So this talk takes me a little bit out of my main area of research. But over the past 17 years at UA Little Rock, I've run across some interesting anecdotes and questions that have probed a little bit further inquiry in the course of teaching classes on Latin American history, the history of the American West, and working with Arkansas teachers to develop curriculum on local and state history. So today's talk represents only a fraction of what me, uh, remains to be investigated on this topic, and I hope to be able to continue research in the future on some of these areas. Both Arkansas and Mexico became political entities in the first decades of the 19th century. As you know, Arkansas became a territory um, in 1819, and Mexico a republic in 1821. So the histories of Arkansas and Mexico actually parallel each other for most of the 19th century, with new beginnings by 1820, the Mexican War in the late 1840s, the Civil War and um, sectional strife in the 1850s and 60s, and then increased industrialization due to improvements in transportation and communication by the end of the 19th century. In the recent past, we've been surrounded by stories of Mexicans seeking out Arkansas as a land of opportunity. We have the highest uh, rate of immigration from Mexico of any state in the country over the last decade. And immigrating here for the short or long term has been a goal of many Mexican families to work and raise their families. However, the evidence demonstrates that in the 19th century, the opposite was true. Arkansans willing to take on risky ventures with the possibility of large gains looked to Mexico for economic opportunity, first in the form of land, the most valuable research resource for the first half of the 19th century, and then by the end of the century in the form of natural resources. These Arkansans were not generally successful in turning their ideas into political and economic success perhaps due to the inability of either Arkansans or Mexicans to establish long-term relationships in a shifting political and economic climate and hampered by race-based economic and social systems, including slavery and peonage. So this first map we see here is um, from 1784. And the 19th century began with the territories that are today Mexico and Arkansas belonging, at least in name, to the Spanish Empire in the Americas. Northern Mexico and Arkansas were both what we might call borderlands or frontier regions, from the European perspective, that is. But in reality, both regions were home to groups of indigenous peoples, many of whom had been pushed out of their ancestral homes by settler colonialism, which had moved other groups further into territory. So we have these sort of shifting migrations. The vast interior of North America was claimed by France in the 17th and 18th centuries due to its trading posts along the Mississippi River, but it had changed hands, at least on paper, to Spanish control after the Treaty of Paris concluded the Seven Years' War in 1763. The Spanish left many French administrators, who also had ties to New Spain, especially in the lower portion of Louisiana, in control of settlements like Natchitoches and the Arkansas Post. Communication with colonial officials in Mexico City occurred via water from New Orleans to Veracruz, then overland to Mexico City, or over the Camino Real, which stretched from Mexico City uh, up through Monterrey to the north, and then up to San Antonio, and finally to East Texas, Nac Nacogdoches, um, which was sort of the twin trading post of the French Nacogdoches. By 1800, Spain and the United States had a tenuous relationship. Bernardo de, Ga de Galvez, who Galveston is named after, had fought on the side of the American revolutionaries, but Spain was reluctant to recognize U.S. independence until after the war. 
The revolution in Haiti and the French Revolution shook the geopolitical relationships of the Americas. Napoleon had gained Louisiana back from Spain briefly after uh, Napoleon's army defeated uh, the Iberian Peninsula, but then he sold it to the United States after Haiti's independence made a French empire in the Americas an impossibility. As the Napoleonic Wars engulfed the Iberian Peninsula in the next decade, Spain was suspect of American expansion attempts along the Mississippi. But Spain was able to do very little given the political situation in Europe and the American colonies where anti-colonial rebellions had begun. Mexican Creoles launched an 11-year bid for independence in 1810, and the Spanish government encouraged during that 1810 to 1821 period colonists in Texas, its northernmost state, giving land grants to Americans such as Moses Austin as a way of trying to gain loyal citizens who could settle the frontier and drive away the Comanche and Apache. So Moses Austin and later his son Stephen got all of these special provisions. They were allowed to bring um, enslaved people into a territory that was um, getting rid of slavery, and by 1821, when Mexican, uh, Mexican independence was um, secured, the Constitution uh, outlaws slavery in Mexico, which included Texas at that point. In 1819, the U.S. and Spain signed the Adams-Onis Treaty, in which Florida was handed over to U.S. control, and then the southern boundary of the Louisiana Purchase was fixed. So at that moment, uh, 1819, when Arkansas becomes a territory, the Red River crossing near Fulton stood as the international boundary between the United States and Spain, and then two years later it would be the international boundary between the United States and Mexico. So in 1821, when Mexico gained its independence from Spain, Arkansas had been a territory for less than two years with a recently elected assembly and a new capital planned at Little Rock. There's some interesting letters between um, Andrew Jackson and President Van Buren about boundary questions between Arkansas and Mexico. And William Fulton was private secretary to Jackson during the Seminole campaign of 1818. So Jackson appointed him secretary of Arkansas territory in 1829, governor in 1835. And he's heavily involved in some of these first negotiations about the boundary between the two places, Mexico and Arkansas. During this period, Mexican newspapers printed orders um, that were correspondence from, uh, from the Mexican government to the military commanders at Nacogdoches, and they, their biggest concerns included things like Indian raids from Arkansas, um, who, so there were native people from Arkansas that were coming in and raiding the settlement at Nacogdoches, and so he was very much encouraging the Ar Arkansas government to limit their movement over the, over the Red River. There was also concern that enslaved African Americans would rebel and join with the Indians, and there were rumors, kind of constant rumors, of this large attack that was going to be imminent at any moment in which uh, slaves would leave their plantations in Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas, and they would join with uh, Native peoples in uh, Arkansas and the Indian Territory, and they would attack um, Anglo-American settlers. They might also attack me Mexican colonists in Texas. So the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is the Southwest Trail, or the Military Road, which um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and you can see the line right here on the map down to Fulton where the, the crossing at the Red River was. So Arkansas Gazette editor William Woodruff frequently mentioned the wagon trains passing through Little Rock on their way to the Red River region. By 1830, the territory's population was nearly 30,000, and an estimated four-fifths of the new arrivals came after 1817 by way of the Southwest Trail. During Arkansas's territorial period, the only towns on the trail were Jackson, Little Rock, and Washington on the way to the Red River crossing at Fulton. So the military road is the more precise road that began to be built during this early period, and Congress um, funded um, at the um, behest of President Jackson um, the military road improvements, including 
um, removing some trees and building bridges and uh, digging some drainage ditches. So the most famous people, um, at least in Texas history, that crossed through the Southwest Trail into Texas were those who uh, fought for Texas independence. And Anglo-Americans traveled southwest through Washington, Arkansas to seek land and opportunity in Mexican-controlled Texas. So again, the Mexican um, president continued the policies of the Spanish government to encourage colonization in Texas um, in order to uh, try to settle the region more permanently against the Comanche and the Apache. Because during this period, especially in uh, this region right here, you can see so these are land grants that were given by the Mexican government, but really, um, and some of them were given during the Spanish period and continued in the Mexican period, but really this whole period right here is, this whole area is labeled Comanche. Um, and the Comanches were clearly in control in that um, part of the continent. But Anglo-Americans were moving further and further west, seeking land um, and, and opportunity. And so many of them moved into Mexico through Arkansas. Um, and many of them also were land speculators. So um, a lot of the people that we associate with the Battle of the Alamo, for example, um, are there because they're particularly, they have financial interests in land speculation and they were trying to get the heck out of Dodge from where they were first and move to someplace new where they may not be uh, known as swindlers as much as they were in the places they had come from. So whenever, um, it's funny, I'm, I'm from Texas and so um, it, it's very interesting. I kind of collect textbook accounts of the Texas independence and U.S.-Mexican war from different time periods and also from different perspectives. And this story is one that's always told so differently depending on who's doing the telling. But the Arkansas connection is kind of interesting and I've spent some time talking to, to Bill Worthen about this. Um, of course we know about the Bowie knife, um, James Bowie's famous knife, uh, knives which um, Certainly, there were a lot of knives made by uh, James Black at Washington, Old Washington, and uh, some of them may or may not have been used at the Alamo. Um, but certainly, they were within circulation in both what was then northern Mexico and in Arkansas and in the southeastern United States. Um, also, uh, the tavern at Old Washington, that's uh, before it was rebuilt, was also a stopping over point for people like uh, Davy Crockett and the men he brought from Tennessee um, and William Travis as they traveled into Texas um, to uh, seek land and uh, fight for Texas independence. Bowie, Travis, and Crockett, along with at least two Arkansans, were killed at the Alamo. And of course, Sam Houston also spent time in Arkansas. And Sam Houston would become um, the, the uh, president of the Republic of Texas and was instrumental really as a go-between between, between Mexico, Texas, the United States, and then the Cherokee, um, who again had been pushed west uh, into Arkansas Territory. So again, this is just, I think one of the really interesting things is how much this whole area um, is really a borderland frontier region where there's no one group that's clearly in charge. There are a lot of people sort of vying for power, including you know, San Antonio had been a settlement since 1718, so it had a, a settled population of um, Spaniards and mixed race mestizos um, who were uh, Tejanos, they called themselves. Um, but then th there was so much influx of Anglo-Americans into, into Texas um, that that was a new dimension. Uh, never mind the Comanches and then groups like the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, who had been pushed out from um, further east in the United States. So we've got a lot going on in the first part of the 19th century there. So at, you know the end of the story, and uh, Texas does um, win its independence um, from Mexico in 1836 when Santa Ana is surrounded at the Battle of San Jacinto. He signs a treaty um, as a prisoner of war 
which the Mexican Congress doesn't recognize. And um, it takes a while to work out the details from that, really until about 1843, um, and Sam Houston was involved in that as well. So you can see this is reported in the Mexican newspapers, um, and the Mexican newspapers continue to be critical of US settlers, Anglo-American settlers, moving through Arkansas into what is uh, Mexico, in this case, all the way over to New Mexico, Santa Fe, so across the Arkansas River um, to Santa Fe to participate in trade, in, uh, mostly in buffalo hides, um, but also, you know, Bent's Fort on the Arkansas was a huge, uh, near La Junta, Colorado, was a huge trading post in Mexican territory at that time, and it attracted a lot of um, Anglo-Americans moving across the Santa Fe Trail towards um, the southern, what would become part of the southwestern United States. So um, in this particular article that I have um, posted here, the Mexico City newspaper is protesting that armed invaders from Missouri, Illinois, and Arkansas were moving into New Mexico to try to gain control over it the same way that they had moved into Texas. So they're sort of accusing them of being opportunists. Um, and during this period, it's important to note that Mexico experienced a great deal of political instability. So in the first 25 years after Mexico's constitution was written, there were 33 different um, chief executives. They actually weren't all different people. Santa Ana served six or seven times um, <laughs> as, uh, as leader during that time period. But there's a tremendous deal of instability in Mexico. And so uh, they were not in a great position to try to put uh, a lot of restrictions on immigration into uh, northern Mexico. And again, here's another map that can show you some of the, the major trade routes um, and um, the settlements. And you can see, again, this, this southwest corridor right here um, from Arkansas Post and then uh, along the Red River and then through East Texas where there had been French settlements in Louisiana and Spanish settlements in, uh, in Texas. So this was the, the um, overland route to Mexico and then the Santa Fe Trail um, stretches this way. So you're likely familiar with Arkansas's connections to the U.S.-Mexican War due to um, a lot of work that the Old State House has done here, including the exhibit several years ago um, called Try Us. I, that was fun. I got to help participate in that as well um, on the Mexican history side of things. So um, many Arkansans participated in the U.S.-Mexican War um, as, because they saw an opportunity for personal advancement. So you might remember um, that, that soldiers who had served in the War of 1812 um, were rewarded with pensions of land, including so that the survey that maps out the baseline, um, that is also the same survey that's used to distribute land to War of 1812 veterans. And so perhaps they were expecting something similar from the, the U.S.-Mexican War, but in any event there were um, many Arkansans um, who participated in the U.S.-Mexican War. Fort, Fort Texas, which saw some of the first action in the war, was commanded by Major Jacob Brown, who died during the siege of the Battle of Resaca de la Palma after being hit by cannon fire. The official congressional declaration of war came days after that first um, skirmish, and Brown's death also prompted other Arkansans to volunteer for the war. So there were 10 mounted units, including two from Pulaski County, that were assembled and then they had to travel overland to San Antonio where they were provisioned and sent into Mexico. But they, they weren't very well equipped when they went into Mexico, but they were also meeting Mexican troops that um, had a core group of military leaders that were well paid and well equipped, but the Mexican military itself was also in disarray after having fought off, um, well, fought for independence. And then uh, they had been back and forth with um, attempted invasions by the French. The Pastry War, for example, um, is in that period. 
So well-known uh, volunteers included um, Borland, Congressman Archibald Yell, Albert Pike and his Little Rock Guards, which included <coughs> William Woodruff's son Alden. Arkansas troops marched south through nor uh, northern Mexico and they joined Taylor's forces in Saltillo and they participated at the Battle of Monterey. They were also involved in several unauthorized killings of Mexican soldiers, including a massacre near Agua Nueva, reportedly to avenge the death of a Pulaski County soldier who was found dead. But there was a lot of, um, you know, there are a lot of sketchy things that were happening with um, the troops that were in uh, northern Mexico that had gone over land. Um, and some of them ended up uh, being reprimanded for those things later and some not. By early 1847, the early enthusiasm for the glory of war had dissipated and the Arkansas troops numbers were depleted. Approximately 390 of the 870 volunteers had been wounded, killed, captured, or were unfit for duty. Um, a call for additional infantry volunteers from the state wasn't met with the kind of positive response that had uh, met the first request for volunteers. So again, we try to think, well, why, are, why is the United States fighting Mexico in the first place? Well, this was about a, a boundary dispute. Um, the treaty that Santa Ana had signed placed the boundary at the Rio Grande River, which is the yellow line that looks like the boundary of Texas today. Whereas Mexico had always claimed the boundary of this, the province of Texas, which was part of the northern state of Coahuila and Texas, at the Nueces River, which is this river right here. So there's this disputed territory right here. And that's where the first, um, the first skirmishes took place at uh, near Fort Texas. Yell, Archibald Yell, uh, was killed during the Battle of Buena Vista in 1847. Borland and 70 other soldiers were captured near Saltillo and they were marched to Mexico City as prisoners of war. Um, but by September 1847, U.S. troops had marched to Mexico City all the way overland from Saltillo, Monterey. And uh, they joined General Winfield Scott's troops who had landed in Veracruz and marched to the capital city from the south. Mexican troops were defeated at Chapultepec Castle and Santa Ana agreed to withdraw from battle to avoid fighting in the streets of the capital. So once again, he is um, on the losing side, even though he keeps popping up as, as sort of a, a leader in Mexico during this time where there was so many uh, people vying for power. So basically the 1821 and really until um, the 1877, uh, the main fight in Mexico is between conservatives and liberals. And the conservatives are uh, supported by the military, professional soldiers, um, and by the Catholic Church who don't want to see their um, rights eroded. And they favor a strong centralized government, um, a president, but the president could serve multiple terms, although the president was always kicked out of office during this term and, you know, during this time period because there's so much instability. Um, and then the liberals and sort of the face of the liberal movement in, um, in Mexico during this time period is Benito Juarez, who was from Oaxaca and he was a Zapotec Indian who had been educated um, in missionary schools. And he's going to become the hero of the 1860s in, in Mexico, the late 1860s. But it takes you know, a good 40 years for that kind of stability to develop in Mexico and a couple of French invasions and a war with the United States. So by that time, Mexico is really depleted in terms of uh, willingness to fight um, and uh, money to be able to carry on these, these wars. So again, Arkansans, Americans see this and are thinking, we've got an opportunity here. So Ambrose Sevier was in uh, Congress at the end of uh, the U.S.-Mexican War. And um, he, there's a lovely, very long speech you can find uh, printed, you know, it's like a 15-page uh, speech he gave in Congress, asking for, for more money and really proposing that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo did not go far enough. And instead of just adding this territory, 
to the United States that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ought to consider taking more of, of Mexico. And so, you know, there was a really uh, a, a big fight over uh, within the United States over, first of all, whether the war should have been conducted at all, right? You'll remember that Abraham Lincoln didn't uh, support it, that this is the war that Henry David Thoreau gets put in jail for, for, for refusing to pay his taxes to support what he felt was an immoral war. And so uh, many Northerners were against the war, and Southerners um, saw it as an opportunity to perhaps add to the number of uh, territories in which slavery was accepted. Now, obviously they hadn't spent much time in Mexico because <laughs> northern Mexico in particular is not well suited for plantation agriculture. And there are only a few areas in Mexico where that kind of uh, plantation agriculture would have even uh, been an enterprise that, that could have been acceptable or potentially profitable even with enslaved laborers. So um, they needed to know their geography a little bit more before they decided to, to do that. But Severe was, was uh, he resigned Congress to, to become commissioner to Mexico in 1848, and he did help uh, put the final touches on the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. He finally came around to that this was the best solution for the present. Um, and uh, in the final treaty, Mexico gave up any claims on Texas, and the border was set at the Rio Grande River. And um, the United States gained lands from New Mexico to California, for which they would pay $10 million to settle claims um, like those that had been made in 1843 in that newspaper article I showed you earlier. Um, against Anglo-Americans who had come in and uh, stolen livestock or, or land or goods from um, Mexicans. Pre-existing land claims were, were supposed to be respected under the treaty, um, but some of them, you might not be surprised to learn, are still litigated in court today, especially over water rights. Um, and some 80,000 Mexicans within the new U.S. boundaries were given a choice to migrate south into what was now Mexican territory, or they could choose to become American citizens and try to fight for their land titles. And many of them did stay, um, but they were fighting for, for the next 100 years um, to retain possession of their land, and, and many of them lost land as well. Severe did help negotiate further guarantees for landholders, and he did help convince the Senate to ratify the treaty, because remember, uh, some senators were thinking it was too much land, some senators were thinking it was not enough land since Mex the Mexican capital had been defeated, um, but this is what we ended up with. He died soon after returning to Arkansas, via Washington, D.C., and he was not successfully able to uh, win his Senate seat back after he had resigned to do this commissioner. So this, really, this negotiation, uh, a lot of people think it, it stressed him to the point that and the travel of, of killing him. In 1853, there was an additional treaty negotiated with Mexico for the Gadsden Purchase, which included part of southern um, Arizona, and that was for a railroad right-of-way. Um, and uh, the true Democrat here in town reprinted um, lots of information about the ongoing negotiations about that territory as well. Another really kind of interesting um, Arkansan connection to Mexico and Central America during this time period that has to do with expansion, really not giving up on the idea of expanding slavery into Mexico is um, Senator Borland, who had won Sevier's congressional seat, and he ends up resigning from Congress in 1853 to become minister to Central America. And now Central America had split off from Mexico shortly after Mexican independence. Borland wanted to add Nicaragua to the United States, and he also uh, encouraged Honduras to rebel against Great Britain. And he he was behind a scheme that would have added Nicaragua and Honduras as potential territories to the United States, places that slavery could expand to, and 
Uh, Nicaragua was particularly of interest because it was the site of the overland route across uh, Central America by, way, by which uh, people and goods traveled from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean prior to the construction of the Panama Canal. Um, Borland got himself into trouble. He was, in, he was injured in a protest when he was trying to protect an American steamboat captain who was responsible for the murder of uh, a local um, citizen in Nicaragua. And um, again, there's some question as to whether Borland and the steam steamboat captain were kind of following the lead of people like William O. Walker, who saw themselves as filibusters. And filibusters tried to raise basically private armies to go establish coloni colonies that, like Texas, might then be added to the United States as territories. It's kind of hard for us to think of, I mean, it doesn't seem like a viable scheme these days, but again, in the interest of, um, got to remember the, the mindset of expansionism and especially looking for other uh, lands to add to the United States and especially lands where <laughs> slavery might be acceptable, um, they, were, they were pretty creative in their thinking. Uh, President Pierce ended up having to send a warship to Greytown uh, or San Juan, Nicaragua. <laughs> and the entire town was destroyed after that scuffle between Borland and the steamboat captain and the local population there. Um, and they had 24 hour notice to evacuate. The town decided not to evacuate. Pierce uh, just gave uh, orders for the town to be destroyed. Borland returned to the United States. He was not asked to remain in his post as, um, as minister to Central America and he later served in the Confederate Army during the Civil War. James Buchanan's uh, message to Congress in 1859, which was reprinted in The True Democrat in 1860. Um, oh, there's Sevier and there's the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Um, it lamented the wrongs suffered by the United States during Mexico's period of instability following independence and the U.S.-Mexican War. Um, there's scarcely any form of injury, Buchanan said, which has not been suffered by our citizens in Mexico during the last few years. We've nominally been at peace with the Republic, but so far as the interests of our commerce, for our citizens who have visited the country as merchants, as shipmasters, or in other capacities, we might as well have been at war. Life has been insecure, property unprotected, and trade impossible, except at a risk of loss which prudent man cannot be expected to incur. Buchanan recommended to Congress to authorize military force to enter the country and obtain indemnity for the past and security for the future. This language is really similar to what the Mexico City papers were complaining about in 1843, that, uh, that troops or private citizens might enter the country with the intent to take property that they felt was owed them as a debt on wrongs that had been committed American citizens. So both countries during this time period were claiming that their citizens had been and were continuing to be harmed by the other country. American Southerners still saw Mexico as a potential territory to which to expand the institution of slavery. Meanwhile, in Mexico, <laughs> um, France, Emperor Napoleon III, had decided to uh, go to Mexico to try to collect on debts owed French citizens and um, shop around the idea of putting Napoleon III's brother Maximilian as emperor in Mexico. Um, well, they need a leader, they need a strong leader, it's been some instability, so we'll, we're going to see if Maximilian will give a try. Now, Maximilian was actually more of a liberal than a conservative, but he was supported by conservatives, so he was in a really hard place from the beginning, and he was convinced that the people in Mexico wanted him, which they did not, except for a few uh, people who thought that they might gain or profit by the relationship with the French. Um, and again, they were trying to hold on to land and stuff that would have been lost to the, to the um, liberals in Mexico. So 
Emperor Maximilian um, decides to act in much of the same way as the Spanish crown and then later the first Mexican government does and encourage colonization as a way of trying to gain a power base within Mexico. So uh, he reaches out to Confederates um, who by this point have um, seen this by 1864 when he's in power. Confederacy has almost lost the war, and we have some Confederate generals and soldiers trying to figure out what's next for them, right? They don't know what a peace treaty might look like. They don't know what kind of amnesty might be offered. And so uh, Napoleon and Emperor Maximilian um, talk with Commodore Matthew Maury of Virginia um, about an immigration plan for Confederates to move to Mexico. Now, ultimately, many more Confederates move uh, to Brazil than to Mexico, but the scheme is quite a detailed scheme that involved uh, Mari being named as Imperial Commissioner of Immigration for Mexico. He got a salary, an office, a stipend for materials, and then he named immigration agents in several states and cities. Now, Arkansas wasn't one of them, but he does convince Thomas Hinman to um, to uh, move to Mexico as part of his colonizing scheme and another man, John Bryant, to start his own colony in Chihuahua in Mexico. The scheme involved transporting formerly enslaved people to Mexico along with the families that they had, had been forced to serve, where they were to work in a labor relationship that Mari called apprenticeship, right? It wasn't slavery. But the United States government protested very loudly that this was a continuation of slavery. Um, so we're almost at a point of breaking off diplomatic relations again, the United States and Mexico over this colonization scheme with former Confederates. Uh, but again, there's not much appetite for war right after the Civil War. So Maximilian ha was seeking supporters wherever he might find them. He agreed to help the new colonists with an initial grant of land but there was little support throughout Mexico for this immigration scheme. Historian Andres Resendez has argued that the Confederate migration to Mexico is one point in a larger, longer arc of Spanish and Mexican efforts to attract settlers to their northern borders in order to gain political favor and try to control the region, just like the earlier land grants to Americans like Moses Austin. So uh, Thomas Hinman moves to Monterey, Mexico after the Civil War. All of the enslaved persons his family brought with them to Mexico left once they arrived, unsurprisingly, right? And here's his uh, letter um, that, uh, well, the State Archives has now that was reprinted in the Arkansas Historical Quarterly. Um, and he says, all the Negroes decided to leave us upon our arrival here. Um, he wanted to get Mexican servants. He was having trouble at that. Don't bring any furniture. You can get furniture here locally. It's too difficult to try to bring your whole household. Um, he is positive about the way that the authorities have treated them. Um, and he's learning Spanish, right? This is part of the problem. Mari, Matthew Mari, who uh, spearheaded the whole effort, didn't ever learn Spanish. Um, it seems a little bit strange if you're going to start a colony there. Um, the Desert Citizen in 1866 printed a notice about Mexico because there had been letters to the editor inquiring about whether uh, people in the city should move to this new colony in Mexico. And uh, this was written from Havana um, by uh, General Early of Virginia after he had moved to Havana, abandoning Mexico after three months. His advice to potential immigrants from the South was that there was much fertile land, but that land titles can't be secured and guaranteed, and that many have returned from Mexico after frustration. For those who have stayed, it's exceedingly difficult to procure labor. You're gonna have to work the land yourself. Um, and the native populations, he says, can't be relied upon for, uh, for labor. 
So um, he says Mexico has resources, but the government's not very stable right now. And um, so those expecting to find beautiful and fruitful land that were, was described by Mari in his colonization pamphlets will be bitterly disappointed. And he said it will be as sad a disappointment as that experienced by the old Spanish conquerors in their fabled search for the fabled El Dorado. So um, the Desert Citizen continues to print other letters from, um, from Arkansans like Colonel Johnson from Circe, who uh, had lived in Carlota, which is the name of the main colony in the Cordova Valley in, um, in Mexico. It was between Veracruz and Mexico City. And he was still living there in, in a colony organized by Sterling Price of Missouri for, uh, for about eight months. I'm not really sure what happened with him. Probably the only successful person who had a, a happy life after migrating to uh, Mexico after uh, the Civil War was George W. Clark, who was a former Confederate major from Van Buren, and he had been editor of the Arkansas Intelligencer. He started the English language newspaper, The Two Republics, in 1867 after Benito Juarez's forces knocked Maximilian out of, uh, out of power in Mexico. Clark was elected to the Arkansas Senate in 1850. He had moved to Kansas as an Indian agent and advocate for a pro-slavery constitution there. In 1860, he shows up in the census in Fayetteville. He migrated to Mexico after the war and he lives there all the way until 1881 and he successfully operates the most important uh, English language newspaper in Mexico City. So he reinvented a lot. He was really the only one during this period that I was able to find who successfully reinvented himself by capitalizing on an opportunity in Mexico. The last thing I want to talk about is the uh, period from 1870 to 1900, um, 1877 to, um, to 1911 is known as, a, as the Porfiriato in Mexican history because Porfirio Diaz comes to power and he basically stays in power for most of that time. Um, and it was the best period for U.S.-Mexican uh, relations, including relations with Arkansas. And that's because of um, the increased commercial investments. Um, and those commercial investments involved uh, a rail line, the Iron Mountain rail, Railroad, um, which ends up connecting with rail lines in Texas and going into Monterey and Saltillo, which were still the most uh, frequented cities for Arkansans um, doing business and, and probably still are today. Um, and uh, then a new uh, railway that was going to connect Kansas City um, through Mina, the Port Arthur route, all the way down to Port Arthur here. Um, which was going to try to rival Galveston and New Orleans as another steam port for Veracruz. So uh, during this period, um, the St. Louis Iron Mountain and Southern Railroad uh, paralleled the Southwest Trail. It connected the International and Great Northern Railway and allowed Arkansans to travel to Saltillo, Monterey, San Luis Potosi, and Mexico City. Um, in 1881, we still are getting allegations, um, this time in the Russellville Democrat, that General Grant was working with allies to try to conquer Mexico. It comes back again, right? This is the beginning of Porfirio Diaz's period. By the end, that talk had completely died down and Mexico was under more stable leadership. The president of the Iron Mountain Railroad in 1881 said, the only conquest that can or will be made of Mexico is a commercial one by building railroads and opening it to trade and commerce. And that's what happened during the Porfiriato. During this time period, Arkansans attempted to capitalize on the friendship between Arkansas and the United States by traveling, working, and investing in Mexico. And the most prominent of those individuals was Powell Clayton, former um, governor of the state, who was appointed by President McKinley in 1895 as ambassador to Mexico, where he served from 1895 to 1907. The English language newspapers in Mexico City praised him. His son was his attache, and he had to re resolve several disputes um, by which American companies were trying to steal guano on uh, bat dung um, for nitrites, um, for fertilizer, off of uh, offshore islands um, in the Yucatan Peninsula. 
Uh, they just parked their ships on the islands and started helping themselves to over 20,000 tons of guano. Um, he also negotiated Mexican neutrality during the Spanish-American War in a time that most of the Latin American countries were, were um, opposed to U.S. intervention there, even though they wanted to see Cuban independence. By the end of the 19th century, relations across the border, right in the immediate border region, grew more tense because of increased activity by the Texas Rangers against Mexican citizens. Pal Clayton ended up being part of those negotiations for monetary reparations to people who had been harmed. And finally, he was involved in the negotiations related to the Panama Canal's location and the United States guarantee of Panamanian independence from Colombia with a promise that the canal route could cross Panama. So uh, Pal Clayton's kind of at the table introducing folks to each other during that time period. U.S. investment during the Porfiriato in land and mining grew exponentially, and Powell's dispatches from Mexico and the English language newspapers in Mexico City en encouraged investors to consider purchasing land. And this even included a delegation that Clayton hosted from the five civilized tribes who sent representatives to Chihuahua to look to see if land there would be a better solution than Indian territory. Um, and that I thought was an interesting a bit of information. These are, um, this is a really funny, the Board of Trade gave a uh, banquet in Pal Clayton's honor when he was back in town briefly in 1899. And um, the menu is really interesting. It's got imported things from Mexico. Uh, the toasts are really kind of funny. Um, and the songs they sang. And I want to end with a couple of uh, things that show us that uh, stereotypes about Arkansans and Mexicans on the part of each other have really not changed too much from the 19th century, unfortunately. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to see uh, more change. But um, in these two travelers' accounts uh, from the 19th century, we have a description of Arkansans by a Mexican and a description of Mexicans by Arkansans. And they they're pretty typical of what you see in the newspapers of both places. Uh, the Mexican description of Arkansans. Well, the inhabitants of this part of the United States generally lack civilization. There are many who are similar to our Indians, although they are always more proud. They always carry knives in the form of daggers, which they use against wolves, bears, and other fierce beasts. Even in the most remote villages, um, it is not civilization, but the effects of terror imprinted on the spirits of the inhabitants, who may not appear to be hostile to travelers, but you should watch out. In the places I am talking about, where there is neither civilization, nor fear, nor religion, men only respect each other for their strength and individual power. And then he goes on to give uh, an anecdote about uh, uh, Arkansas, uh, a man who was accused of murder, on a steamboat, and because they knew that Arkansans would be swift to dispense uh, justice, the man was offloaded in Arkansas, where he was quickly tried and hung within a six-hour period, instead of leaving him on the steamship to be carried to justice uh, in New Orleans. And then uh, from Mina, there's a description, uh, it's really interesting, there's a, a traveler's account of travel through Mexico alongside a very big, like, full column ad for uh, a, uh, like a travel agent trying to encourage Arkansans to come to Mexico, buy a plane ticket to Mexico to see the independence festivities. Um, but right next to that was, a, a Mina furniture salesman, Charles McGee's description of his trip to Mexico City. And he said, the native, natives are very slow in adopting the advanced ideas of their northern neighbors, and the skilled laborers for the country come larger from the United States, as the ones within the country are not skilled. Uh, the wages of peons are from 15 to 20 cents in silver, which is only six to nine cents per day in the United States. The Mexicans live in a very primitive way. He complains about pickpockets, theft, the Catholic Church, too many Catholic churches, there being a place of worship for every thousand inhabitants, and that the affairs of the church and state were too closely intertwined. So it's all the same sort of stereotypic, uh, stereotypical responses about Catholicism and uh, you know, unskilled labor, 
versus uh, Arkansans, the stereotypes too about being sort of rough and tumble uh, frontier folks. So in the end, um, what I've found just by looking at uh, some randomly scattered sources over the past um, 17 years on and off was that as September 1899 rolled around, a new century was on the horizon. Travel and trade between Arkansas and Mexico had increased. Railroad and mining boosters encouraged interactions between the territories, but it wasn't until the Mexican Revolution and the Great Depression which caused vast displacement within Mexico. Also the Panama Canal, which facilitated trade within the Americas, World War I, which limited the transatlantic connections, that the United States and Mexico and in relation Arkansas and Mexico saw more extensive connections of labor and trade. In the end, the risky colonization and expansion ventures didn't pan out in the 19th century, and it was Mexicans who would look to Arkansas for economic opportunity by the second half of the 20th century. Thank you very much.